Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I hope folks can uh, see the screen and hear me okay so far. Thanks so much for your patience. Sorry for starting um, a couple uh, minutes behind here as we are resolving a quick audio issue. Um, so thank you so much for your patience for that. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome. This is data storytelling for nonprofits. This is part three in our series um, all about cultivating a strong data culture. Um, it's okay if you haven't been to parts one through two of this series. If you're interested in slides and resources, please feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to share those um, after this workshop today. I'm Ari, I am your intrepid facilitator today. Uh, we are gonna get to intros in a second, but first let's check in on our learning objectives. So we're gonna be talking about data-centered work culture, data for program evaluation and data collaboration today, as well as sharing some, oops, excuse me, some free resources for further learning. I'm also really happy to have Chris Plus and Michaelin Gasparch with us as our featured speakers who are going to be leading our learning journey today. Chris and Michaelin work over at Kids for Chicago um, and they partnered with us on a recent data project. So I'm really, really happy to have them on board to showcase their organization. Uh, we're gonna get to their intros in a few minutes here, but first we're gonna cover some brief contextual info. Um, we're also gonna have two short group discussions this hour that you can participate in uh, via chat if you like, or you can unmute and use audio. So you'll have an opportunity to connect with your fellow participants and discuss what, what you're learning, share your own experience. Um, I am my coworker, Susan Peking, will be monitoring the chat throughout, or you can also raise your hand um, or use audio and video. We're also gonna close with a Q&A section as well. So we're gonna have ample time to talk about any specific questions that you might have. So with our housekeeping done, welcome. Um, let's introduce ourselves, ourselves in the chat. Please go ahead and post your name, your pronouns, if you wish, um, your organization, your location. I'm really interested in knowing where everyone is based. Uh, while you're all doing that, I will intro myself so you know a little bit more about me and my connection to data science. So I'm Ari Zika, my pronouns are they, them, and he, him, and I'm the Community Data Fellows Program Manager here at the Data Science Institute at the University of Chicago. And I'm based in beautiful Chicago today. Uh, my background is in public and academic libraries and municipal government. So I have a really deep love and appreciation for how data informs and improves our work, especially in the social impact sectors. Uh, my program, Community Data Fellows, essentially pairs UChicago graduate students with nonprofits like yourselves uh, to develop and complete capacity building data science projects designed for each organization's individual needs. See a lot of folks, lots of folks from um, Midwest. Awesome, hello, Ohio friends and Midwest friends. We have such a diverse group today. I'm really excited to have you all on board. A little bit of background about the DSI. So DSI does all things data science at UChicago. Um, we're really built on three foundational pillars of education, society, and research. And we have a really distinctive approach to data science that is characterized by defining new fields through rigorous inquiry and also a really deep engagement with our communities. Our education portion includes undergraduate program, multiple graduate programs, as well as a new PhD program that we're very excited about. We provide education and outreach programs to affect sustainable and scalable change. And we also have multiple interdisciplinary use-driven research for tackling societal and scientific problems. Pictured here is our most recent winter cohort of fellows. Um, my work with our Community Data Fellows Program really intersects with our foundational society pillar, which we call community-centered data science. Our goals for community-centered data science include developing an ethical, diverse, and purpose-driven next generation of data scientists, like these amazing fellows pictured here. Um, we're working to build data science research and education capacity for mission-driven social impact organizations um, and sustaining really long-term mutually beneficial partnerships with them, um, like our partnership with the folks over at Kids for Chicago. And we're also working with those organizations to scale impact across the social sector through continued development of open source data science tools. So let's talk about a little bit of definitions first, just in case you're new to the terminology. Uh, data science is not a monolith. It is an interdisciplinary process of math, statistics, computer science, it's domain sciences, communication, social impact. All these spheres are working together 
to distill knowledge from data sets. Knowledge about those raw data sets can turn into insights. So insights and um, uh, ideas about our world, our community, our audiences, our scope of work. Those insights can then turn into action. So that means making decisions, changing directions, um, improving processes, scoping out plans. I'm sharing this DSI graphic with you all because I think it really shows our unique approach to data science, which is the inclusion of that social implications of data piece, because our approach is really rooted in equitable and inclusive solutions that are gonna benefit all our communities. A little bit about the data maturity assessment. I hope you all had the option to uh, to take it. Um, if not, that's okay. You can check through your email for the link that I sent you all to take this assessment later. Uh, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to think through. Uh, if you completed it, you probably saw an overall score out of 10 and then a breakdown of three other scores in the sections of purpose, practice, and people. Um, a little bit about this maturity assessment. So what it is, is a way for organizations to get a snapshot view of their data journey, um, a tool for identifying ways um, that you can strengthen your data practices and find areas of opportunity and growth. What it is not, is it's not a report card. So if you are um, seeing a score of like two, three, four, don't be discouraged. What this does is just show you where you have options for evaluating how you're using your data, uh, what your data and collection and analysis processes are and how data ties into your over overarching organizational mission and culture. So data.org builds their principles on three pillars, purpose, practice, and people. Last time, last session, we talked about practice and how to center ethical data practices in your organization's work and your relationship with data. This workshop primarily focuses on this people portion, which relates to how your organization creates a collaborative culture of being data informed and data driven. So why are we talking about data as a part of organizational culture? It's important because data is not a one person job. It's essential to benefiting insights and decisions throughout your organization. Data culture is a part of good storytelling, right? It's a group effort to tell the story of your organization and impact. You probably already have like communications or marketing or engagement staff who are involving all these different pieces um, and perspectives and faces in showcasing your work and your impact. And a solid data culture is very similar to that. It's connecting across departments, teams, or working groups to show a holistic view of your organization and your impact. Some indicators of a healthy data culture are some things like having a data expert on your leadership team. So going a little bit beyond just leadership buy-in for a data culture and having someone who is familiar with those practices on the leadership team. Um, it looks like your organization investing in data tools or trainings for staff, making that information available. Organization-wide data-driven decision-making. Are you um, making strategy decisions based on the data that you've gathered about your uh, about your programs, about your impact. It also looks like data engagement across all elements of your organization. So from frontline staff to leadership, to boards, to uh, stakeholders, and your data is accessible and relevant to staff. It's not siloed off and it's open and available to people to learn from. Okay, we have a little discussion moment here. So we're gonna spend a couple minutes just kind of sharing out some reflections real quick before we dive into what Chris and McKaylin are gonna be leading us through. So real quick, just in a chat, everyone kind of share and so we can get a sense of where we're all at in your specific organization. Do you feel like data is more of a team effort or is it more dedicated to one or two people? Um, if you're not comfortable sharing, that's okay. But just to get a sense, team, yeah. <laughs> it does sound like the dream patients, thank you. Um, I'll share a little bit about, so at DSI and my role and experience, my team works really, really hard to make data a collaboration. We're sharing a lot with each other, um, but a lot of other organizations you might see just have like one or two folks who are in charge of data and primarily engage with it. Is anyone interested in sharing any, uh, any more singular folks, any team-based folks? Oh, thank you for sharing, resharing that in the chat, Susan. Awesome. While we're reflecting on that too, think about your organization's work with data. Uh, what do you feel like your organization is doing really, really well? Uh, do you have a lot of collaborative conversations? Uh, are you using data to evaluate your impact? 
Um, I know we just finished annual report season. So are you using data to talk about the meaning of your work? Are you engaging your community in data? Julie says, it's just me. Oh, Julie, I hope we can provide you a little bit of connection as well. <laughs> Oh, thanks, patient. Yeah, team effort, but a little siloed. Um, oh, I'm so glad that you have multiple team members on that call. That's such a great, um, a, a great thing to do to engage with that together. Um, I'm happy that you're invested. Rad. Um, oh, and Julie says that uh, they do have collaborators, but the only data person, which I feel like is a very common, common um, experience for a lot of organizations. And I know Michaela and Chris are going to chat about that a little bit as well. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in then. Um, thank you for the discussion participation. We're gonna jump into the bulk of our workshop content. I am so happy to talk about Kids First Chicago. So Kids First Chicago is an education policy and advocacy organization. It's based here in Chicago. Um, if you wanna learn more about their work, check out their website, sign up for their newsletter to stay in the know. Um, they're our feature for this workshop because they actually partnered with my program, the Community Data Fellows Program for the autumn 2023 quarter. Um, so they worked with a fellow on a project about evidence-based funding for public schools in Chicago and tied that into a larger Kids for Chicago initiative to create more transparency around um, how schools are funded here. And the role of the Community Data Fellow was to participate in data collection, data cleaning, so that this raw public data was op optimized to fit into a public facing tool that Kids for Chicago is developing. It was a great project, happy to have them on board. Um, couple intros, Chris is the Senior Manager of Research and Policy at Kids for Chicago. As part of the data science and research team, Chris creates data and policy tools that expand access to education data, as well as knowledge of education policy. Chris has a PhD in sociology and a master's of urban planning and policy from the University of Illinois at Chicago, as well as a BA in sociology from Northeastern Illinois University. McKaylin is a research data analyst at Kids for Chicago. She uses her expertise in technology, data analysts, data analysis and research to inform and empower Chicago parents as decision makers in their children's K through 12 education. McKaylin graduated from Washington and Jefferson College with a BA in neuroscience and received an MS in integrated biomedical science from Rush University. Welcome, Chris and McKaylin. Thanks so much for having us. Can, uh... Am I, can everybody hear me right now? I was having a lot of technical difficulties <laughs> earlier. Um, yeah, thanks Thanks so much for um, inviting us to, to speak today. So uh, just to start off, uh, Kids First was formed in 2015. We're an education advocacy organization that uh, focuses on parent organizing parents uh, to try to get resources and, and shape policy. Uh, our mission is to dramatically improve education for Chicago's children by ensuring their families are respected authorities and what their kids need and decision makers in their kids' education. And we do this by partnering with families to support them in gaining these resources. Uh, there's a link to the website there. I don't think it's clickable, but it's kids for Chicago. Um, can go to the next slide. Yeah. So before we get into the, the meat of the presentation, I just want to give everybody a sense of some of the work that we do. So first, some of the policy work, and then I'll touch on uh, some of the parent organizing that we do. So this is a list of um, some of the work that we've done in shaping local policy in Chicago. Um, we're going to talk, we're going to use Chicago Connected actually as an example today to talk about uh, what collaborative kind of data projects look like. Uh, at Kids First and partnering with other organizations. But just to, to give you a sense of some of the stuff we've done, the annual regional analysis is um, basically like a fact book that helps shape CPS investment. Um, Chicago Connector, we're gonna talk about the accountability redesign. We got involved for a while. Um, Chicago had uh, the school quality rating program uh, to shape basically what schools got resources and what schools got disciplinary action. There was a lot of criticism of that, uh, that model. And so CPS wanted to reshape uh, what its um, accountability system looked like. And Kids First played a role in, in helping shape that and engaging, um, we engaged more than like 20,000 stakeholders to create a new uh, roadmap for deciding what that accountability uh, uh, the new system of accountability looked like. Uh, GoCPS is a tool that allows parents to um, 
basically look up schools and help navigate Chicago's very, very, very complex school system um, where there's many different types of schools and that kind of thing. Uh, and Enrollment Solutions is a re or two research reports that we did examining the causes of uh, enrollment decline in the city of Chicago. And uh, then we had a sort of parent-led effort to, um, to come up with uh, solutions and possible policies that people could implement to address that. Uh, so that's the policy sort of policy side of what we do. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, some of the parent organizing work uh, we have, this is something that McKaylin is going to talk a little bit about one of the programs with that. Uh, but essentially it's organizing parents around issues that they find important. Uh, the first example, our students or school board is uh, political sort of pressure lobbying work to try to make sure that the new, the upcoming um, boundaries for school, the elected school board are representative of CPS. Uh, parents have fought to get you know, new infrastructure like the library and the education first is um, work that parents did to try to get uh, an IB program and um, a regional gifted program at schools. So just some examples of of some of the work uh, that we're doing. You can go to the next slide. Um, oh, I guess I have maybe control over that. I don't know. Um, so today we're gonna, we want it, Michaela and I are going to discuss some ways that data is um, sort of implemented in the, um, or incorporated into kids' work. And at some, we're sort of gonna go sort of at points abstract sort of general principles or ideas and then try to really delve into some examples um, and then step back to sort of analyze it. Um, so hopefully you'll find some of this useful. I think it's important to, to note that when we're talking about this where we understand that this is this might some of this might be unique to kids first or might be unique to um, advocacy and uh, advocacy and activist types of organizations. Uh, so I'm sure everybody's organization looks different, but um, yeah, hopefully there's some kind of something that bits and pieces that that you all can take from this. So we're going to start by talking about program evaluation and how we use data to augment the the work of the parent led organizing. Um, we'll go into talking about the collaborative data projects um, to in, in focusing on that Chicago connected example. Um, to give you a sense of some of the work that Kids First has done in the past. Basically how we've used data to identify problems, like bring urgency to different problems. And Chicago Connected is, is a good example that um, uh, as it's a, a project that helped connect uh, families and students to internet during the pandemic. Um, and then we're gonna folk, the, the last thing we're gonna touch on is some of the challenges that we are facing in our organization and trying to center data um, in the organization. Uh, and ideally that'll, that'll be kind of fruitful ground for some discussion. Uh, the, the challenges piece, I think it's important to note that we, Michaela and I were both hired, um, to sort of build out the data team and research aspect of the organization. Uh, and it's a very cool, I mean, it's a very great thing to have in a, a advocacy organization, like some of the intent to build up a, de a data department. Uh, but there's also challenges to doing that, um, sort of people's perceptions of what data teams do and that kind of thing. So we'll talk a little bit about that and dissect that. Um, yeah, so that's what we got for today. And I'm going to pass it off to uh, Michaela to talk about program evaluation. Thanks. Um, so as Chris mentioned, I'm first going to touch on program evaluation, generally speaking, and its importance as uh, one avenue for centering data in your organizational culture. Uh, then I'll go through a few examples of program eval uh, that we've conduct conducted at Kids First before bringing it back to how you can use uh, the data collected to make data-driven decisions about how to conduct your programs moving forward. So at a glance, program evaluation may seem kind of like common sense. Uh, the idea is to assess your program's efficacy in meeting metrics of success or accomplishing primary outcomes for any particular program, internal, external, what have you. 
Um, however, program evaluation serves as an important pillar or form of infrastructure for centering data practices across multiple departments or teams within your organization. Um, we find it most effective to initiate this evaluation process collaboratively. So uh, having program directors work with data team members from the start ensures that the information necessary for evaluating a program success is captured, uh, ensures that all involved departments are on the same page, and that the program and any future changes to it uh, will be data driven. Um, so now I'll go over a few examples of how Kids First conducts some of its program eval. And next slide. Thank you. Um, so I'll start with our Parent Leadership Fellowship Program. This program exists to teach parents about the principles of community organizing and the history of Chicago public education with a focus on racial justice and equity. Uh, so to evaluate this program, our data and community engagement teams work together to develop assessments that would occur before, during, and after each uh, annual cohort runs. And so before the program begins, we collect baseline information from the parents around our program learning objectives. Uh, then during the program, we run um, what we call a participatory evaluation. So these are live discussion-based evaluations between community engagement members and the parents and aim to assess mid-program progress and collect free-form thoughts uh, that allow for co-design uh, with the parents and provide a sense of how the program is going. Um, and then finally, at the end of the program, uh, we rerun the assessments from the beginning of the program to assess improvement and or achievement of the cohort's learning objectives. So these evaluations are then discussed between the data and community engagement teams uh, to understand what went well and what needs improvement, um, utilizing these data to reform and change the program moving forward. And again, I wanna reiterate that I think that it's this process that really um, makes data a huge focus uh, collaboratively between multiple departments, um, even though not all may be data experts taking this a uh, very planned out collaborative approach really um, is important for getting visibility in, in the data end of things and uh, in, in ensuring program success. So next slide, yes. Uh, so another example of program evaluation on a much larger scale uh, that involved many organizations across the city, I'd like to talk about how we approached Chicago Connected. Um, so for a bit of background, Chicago Connected uh, is a groundbreaking program that provides no-cost, high-speed internet service to CPS students and families. Uh, Kids First helped initiate and carry out the program to help families uh, connect to internet services during the pandemic when schools moved to virtual learning. So evaluating Chicago Connected was handled a bit differently than what we do for parent leadership, uh, the Parent Leadership Fellowship Program. Uh, as Chicago Connected was co-led with city partners and community-based organizations, multiple organizations came together to develop annual surveys to distribute to program participants. So each year, the focus of the evaluation changed. For year one, the objective was to assess if internet service providers were meeting the needs of families and the requirements set as part of the program. And of note, uh, that survey showed that the internet service providers were not meeting uh, the agreed upon standards. And so the Chicago Connected Program leadership was able to use these survey data to confront the providers and ensure that these issues were resolved in the following year. So in year two, the questions surrounding internet service quality were asked again, along with additional questions surveying interest in digital literacy programs, uh, which shaped program offerings that were made available in year three. And then at the end of year three, a co-designed survey, again, between all of the uh, involved organizations was sent out to evaluate the impact of these digital offerings and general program satisfaction. Results from the final survey were then used to draft recommendations for the city of Chicago as uh, formal leadership kind of shifted uh, to be primarily in the hands of the city um, after year three. And so the big takeaways from this example are once again, that program evaluation serves as an anchor uh, for data-driven decision-making and reform, but also as an opportunity to ensure that all collaborative partners are on the same page as, as using data as a focal point. Um, it ensures that everyone is invested in the program and its outcomes. So, uh, thank you. Uh, to wrap up our segment on program evaluation, I'm going to take a step back and briefly touch on what to do with your data or reports. 
um, following a completed evaluation. So it's important to bring these data to your whole org. Uh, while the entire org doesn't necessarily need to be involved in like the nitty gritty or iterative discussions that occur between core program staff, um, keeping everyone aware via like all staff presentations or debriefs can be another good opportunity to collect general feedback or thoughts on ways to improve a program or to steer where to take the next initiative. So these debriefs also serve to keep everyone up to date on program successes um, and added visibility helps keep, keep everyone on track toward data-driven organizational goals. And uh, Chris is going to talk more on the importance of that visibility a bit later. Uh, but for now, I'm going to shift gears and to talk more about uh, how data can be used to kickstart and maintain uh, collaborative initiatives. Uh, so as Chris mentioned earlier, I'll talk a bit more about Chicago Connected and how this project utilized data is a kind of nucleus that uh, brought organizations from across the city together and had them working toward a common goal. So Chicago Connected began with an analysis of public data surrounding household connectivity in Chicago, and this was co-led with the Metropolitan Planning Council. And so in this report, uh, published near the start of the pandemic and the shutdown, uh, we found that more than 100,000 CPS students did not have an active internet connection at home and were unable to attend uh, virtual classes. So this report served as a sort of alarm, uh, raising a feeling of urgency and caused the city to reach out to Kids First for collaboration on how to address the connectivity gap. So our policy team drafted a plan, and this plan um, detailed the need for collaboration and co-leadership with community-based organizations um, across the city, as well as uh, the need for buy-in from philanthropic sources to, to fund our project. Um, so we partnered with teachers, network chiefs, and principals to create a process for selecting community-based organizations to partner with, uh, looking specifically for orgs who could better reach priority communities with the lowest rates of internet connectivity. Um, with these partnerships and co-leadership, Chicago, uh, without these partnerships and co-leadership, uh, Chicago Connected would never have made the incredible reach to the 60,000 households to provide internet service. And so these partnerships and leaderships, leadership efforts uh, were fostered and sustained through the sharing of data and experiences. After initial relationships were established, weekly meetings were held where updates were shared from all involved organizations. So successes were celebrated and future directions and improvement were discussed openly. Um, these efforts, I think, held the momentum needed for sustaining such a large initiative. Um, overall, I think Chicago Connected does stand as a bit of an anomaly in its scope and success, but does speak to the power of data and analytics for building a team of driven organizations uh, working toward a common goal. And for another example of collaboration over a data initiative, I'm going to pass it over to Chris. Thanks. Um, another example, it's kind of a different route um, to collaborating around uh, policy issues and, and trying to use data to do, do that. But uh, currently, Michaela and myself are working on a project uh, to try to make the uh, state's funding formula, which is the evidence-based, EBF stands for evidence-based funding, uh, trying to make that formula uh, more accessible and understandable to a broader public. Um, just a, some shorthand so for context, uh, EBF was rolled out in 2017, um, and it changed the, exist the formula at the time, which was a student-based funding formula, which is basically you have a, a set, it's almost a mostly uniform set uh, uh, amount of money per student. And that's how education is costed out. Switching from that to a resource-based model, which takes into account all the different resources that make education work and then cost it out that way. So it sets like ratios for teachers and librarians and, and what have you per student, cost of technology and that kind of thing. Um, it's a very cool formula. Uh, and I think it addresses uh, what's an education policy called adequate funding. So the formula sets these adequacy targets, which are like the seen as the um, minimum amount of money that a school district would need in order for education to function. Um, it's very neat. It's very complex. Um, and so we're trying to trying to make it 
trying to make it less opaque and demystify it and, and that kind of thing. Um, in this respect, we're part of Kids First is part of a coalition that's doing advocacy work around EBF. Um, and it's going to meetings, speaking to other data people uh, about some of the work has been one way that um, that we've kind of tried to create this, um, create, I guess, interesting projects through coalitional collaboration with our uh, various coalitional partners to augment the work that we're doing. Um, which has a lot of benefits, I think. Um, in my experience, I, I, some of the, I think, most fun and interesting ways to, to work on projects is just to touch base with people, not only in your own organization, but across organizations to kind of, I don't know, get that sort of cross-pollination going, spark ideas, um, bounce ideas off of other people. So Mikhail and myself are bouncing the, uh, the idea of the project that we're working on, on other people that work in this the, edu the EBF uh, advocacy uh, sphere. And it was, you know, it's it's nice to hear like validation or what have you that we're not completely way off course. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any more questions about that, I'd be, I'd be happy to go more into it, but just kind of giving everybody a difference, another sort of sense of, of uh, how Kids First is collaborating with other organizations to create these sort of data data driven projects. Um, we can go to the next slide now. Uh, once again, I'm gonna pivot. Um, so I think one way to think about the work that McKaylin has, has talked about is that this is the sort of using data for operations, using data to promote policy. These are things that our organization have done. More recently, as I said, our supervisor, Jose Pacas, he uh, hired both myself and McKaylin to try to um, really build out the, the role of data in our organization. Um, and it's, again, it's a great, it's, it's great to have that kind of leadership um, to do that, but there's also many challenges to doing that. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I guess what, uh, yeah, so you do the slide before that. Yeah. Um, I think there's a recognition that data science and sort of broader research agendas can be a really powerful tool, but there is, there's a culture in, in our organization of kind of treating data in a, in a narrow way. Uh, and it's sort of a means ends way. So like, off, you know, often other departments will come to us with these kind of ad hoc research requests, like pulling data points or doing lit reviews to sort of substantiate things that they're doing for their campaigns. Um, and while these these are important and they have, I think the, the fact that they have an immediate impact sort of shapes people's perception of the extent of what a data team uh, can really do, especially in, um, in advocacy organizations. Uh, and so really the challenge for us is trying to move beyond this to build up more of a infrastructure that allows the data and research team to sort of be semi-autonomous and able to carry out, um, carry out the mission of the organization and, and um, uh, achieve the strategic objectives of the organization. Um, in my experience, this is kind of, this is common, um, Sorry, we're getting a question. Oh, uh, in, in my experience, this is kind of uh, common in activist organizations more generally. Um, there's a couple examples I can think about from uh, an electoral organization that I worked with um, in which, again, data was treated in a very sort of means and short term way. So it'd be like when when I presented I like projects of doing analyses where like membership is to be able to build power or doing setting up a research agenda around some of the um, the political program and organization. I think it was hard for people to really wrap their heads around, well, what does that get us? What does that get us right now? And so it sort of was seen as like this wonky, like, oh, Chris, he likes working with data, ha, ha, ha. And it was tough to say, well, no, this is actually, this, this, this project and this infrastructure could benefit um, the organization. And I think in similar ways, this, this can happen in Kids First. It's, I, maybe it's like a, you can see it as like a, a growing pain to the organization of like, 
the data team is being um, birthed and it's a painful process sometimes. So sorry, that was terrible. Why did I go with that metaphor? Uh, um, anyways, if we can go to the next slide. <laughs> uh, Michaela and I, we, um, we were thinking about it and we sort of like pulled out like a few, four different th pieces of the challenges. And I think you could also view these as, um, I don't, not, not principles, but important, I guess, issues um, that need to be worked out to really build out a data. Um, having that sort of, again, semi-autonomous, but connected to the mission, sort of mission-driven semi-autonomous um, data team and sort of research department. So leadership is a big one. Ari, you mentioned this earlier. Having, having both a, like, yeah, people in leadership that get what the project is because it's not immediate, it's not, it doesn't, uh, it's not always sort of intuitive to everybody about like the extent or the sort of full possibility of what, um, uh, what a data team can do. Seeing data more or it's almost based on ad, yeah. Um, yeah, this is the, yeah, the, this happens all the time with us and in, this is something that we're trying to move away from, but it's it's a it's a process. Um, I think being able to fit projects into um, the strategic priorities and mission of the organization is another key piece of this. Uh, again, this idea of having having teams that are mission driven and not necessarily always having to be sort of the top down order that comes that is like, you know not having everything needing to be dictated from the director of the organization is an important thing because it allows different departments to kind of do their thing and grow the organization together. There's a cultural issue, again, awareness of what data teams can do. Um, and then the, there is just like the technical issue of the skill involved in, in some of the data work and being able, I mean, one thing that we're trying to do is build out um, an infrastructure that's capable of handling some of these ad hoc requests while also building the necessary um, the the necessary machinery to be able to really effectively uh, use data in our work. You can go on to the next slide. So I kind of already, I touched on some of this, but um, just wanted to give some concretes in terms of what's going on at Kids First to, to move beyond these ad hoc um, requests. So in terms of the leadership issue, our supervisor is uh, really doing uh, ha the hard task, and I think this is an important task, of playing the role, like doing the triage role, um, which good managers should be able to do. So when those the, the um, deluge of requests come in, having a manager be, be able to be the person that kind of stops that and helps prioritize is really helpful for our work because I mean, well, one, that's the, the role of the manager. And two, like McKaylin and I are working on a bunch of other stuff. So it's like hard for, it's sometimes it's hard when you're in the weeds to be able to step back and be able to do all the prioritizing. Um, and also having a supervisor that's able to communicate with other leadership about the, the role, basically what they're trying to um, accomplish through the data team. Um, in terms of the strate strategic issue, uh, we just try to, in terms of what we prioritize. Um, in Kids First, we call them big rock issues. It's basically like strategic objectives. So we try to be very intentional in communicating the the work that we pri prioritize that that fits into the these big rocks or big rock issues or um, strategic objectives. The cultural issue is tough. Um, I think it comes partially, I mean, I think all these things are connected. Uh, you know, carving out time at meetings, I think is an important one to um, to try to sort of uh, help help people understand the work that we do. Cause it's, we, we sometimes get the, the look that we're like, this is, everybody will laugh at this because we're a bunch of nerds. Uh, but we get the look of like, oh, there's the cool, the cool kids in their office just, you know, like d doing their thing and it's like that's our work is inherently like we are just on our computer and sometimes we're chilling and listening to the music and doing our work and, and, and what have you and uh 
you know, there's there's images at least about like what what we're doing and what we're not doing. And I think communicating with the rest of, of staff, especially people that don't have sort of a data background to like what the work is, uh, is, is quite helpful. Um, and especially sometimes like the amount of time that goes into some of the work, like some of the ad hoc requests that come, come in, I, it, I think it's easy for people to say, oh, it's just a quick data point, you can grab it or just do this quick analysis. And sometimes those, that, that quick work actually takes quite a bit of time. Um, and then finally, in terms of this technical issue, in, in uh, more efficiently kind of managing some of these ad hoc requests, uh, building a data infrastructure is, is really important. So the program evaluation piece of it, um, uh, oh, I'm, I'm terrible. I did not mention Asha as our, our other coworker who really works on the membership database. Building that infrastructure is really crucial to, to handle some of the ad hoc requests of, hey, can you get me a list of members, active members, and find what, where they live or find what wards they live in and that kind of stuff. Having that built out allows us to much more efficiently deal with some of these, these asks. We're also trying to build more of a robust data structure um, around like different school data to be able to more easily access or, or respond to quick requests that come up. The, the trouble in this technical part of it is just finding, dedicating the time to do that. Because again, it's not an immediate thing. It, it, it takes a lot of time for payoff that comes in, in the future. Um, but yeah, so these are kind of all ways that we're trying to work on um, trying to more effectively center data in the work that we do. Uh, and I, Aria, will pass it back to you now. Thank you so much. Uh, we are taking our second discussion moment here, so you can feel free to share in the chat where you can raise your hand to use audio or video. Um, and then after that, we'll move into a Q&A, which I see, um, I'll take a brief pause point to, to share um, in the Q&A section down at the bottom of the Zoom. It looks like someone did ask what software services were used for a program evaluation part, and McKaylin has a, a great, really thorough answer for that. So check that out if you're interested in some specific uh, software slash tech um, options for program evaluation. Um, but for this discussion moment, kind of based off of uh, the, the four uh, data culture roadblocks facing um, organizations, what would you think is the priority one for you? I know, uh, Dominique, you mentioned that um, you're getting a lot of uh, ad hoc requests, which uh, uh, thank you, Chris, for addressing that in the chat as well. Um, Christina says that leadership alignment is really major. And at the time it was due to education and level of knowledge and trust in the story that the data told. That is really, really fascinating. Um, thanks for sharing that, Christina. The Michaela and Chris, do you have any um, notes on how to build trust in the data? With I'm guessing that would maybe fall into that culture bucket as well. And I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the full, full, I'm not seeing the question there. Trust in- Yeah, in it's not, as, not it was a, shared by Christina. Um, not necessarily a question, but more of um, a comment about how uh, Christina says that um, the in a previous career, uh, leadership alignment was a major issue. Um, and that came mm -hmm. down to like difficulty um, and a lack of trust in the story that the data told. Um, so when you're looking at this issue of culture, like, um, beyond just trusting um, your work that you're doing with data and sharing like what you do every day, um, how do you build trust in like the data itself that you're accurately reflecting um, your uh, experience, impact, scope of work? Hmm. I, so I don't know, and, and Michaela, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if there is a lack of trust in the data aspect of it. I think, I think there, I think it's difficult for us to convey sometimes like the, the importance of, so for program evaluation, the importance of having a um, up-to-date, uh, accurate membership database, for example. And so like, it can, it, I think there's the issue there. And it's, I think I, you could, you could argue that it's, it's a place of, of trust, um, why that's, that's important to have. But I think sometimes like, so the challenge for that is, 
I think there's a perception of like, oh, you're you're just data wonks and you like having a lot of data and trying to find ways to build like the understanding of like, no, this actually, this helps the, the organizing, like having an accurate up-to-date membership database like helps the organization. So this is not just random data we're getting and, and trying. And so, you know, one way to that we have done that is just really trying to work closely with the community engagement side of the work to be, to say, okay, like what type of information, um, what type of information is important to have that you can have readily accessible? Let's work that into our membership database. But yeah, so I think it takes some sort of that collaboration. Yeah, I guess com communica communicating collaboration, I guess at some point, yeah. I know that sounds so, <laughs> it's like, it, it sounds so cliche or like, like too obvious, but I guess it is obvious. It's just always a lot of work and constant work, yeah. you know? It's and that's I think what it is. It's like the constant communication and and yeah. I think I if I just add to that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, oh, no. Caleb. Add to that. No. <laughs> uh, briefly on the knowledge trust thing. I think um, I think that that's something that we do. The knowledge part. I think that we do encounter at our org, and I think that we've kind of addressed this in ways of like um, when we rolled in Salesforce, like holding like trainings and workshops for explaining the process and the context for why we're using it and how to use the technical tool, um, I think helps generate buy-in. So I think general context and expressing, it, like you don't have to get into the weeds, but like how an analysis is done and showing that transparency, I think is helpful for increasing knowledge and buy-in um, with general data initiatives. Yeah, and, and to that point too, uh... Asha, our, our colleague Asha, who does a lot of the work around Salesforce, has regular office hours for people that ask questions. And like, uh, it's it, since I've been there, at least there's getting her time to talk and um, reiterate stuff or, or what have you at um, all staff meetings. Like we were try, trying to create some space for that. Uh, real quick, I, there was a question too about um, where did it go? Uh, about the issue being social. I can, I'm having trouble navigating this chat for some reason. Oh, yeah, I did a little type. Yeah. What, what was it? No, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm going to scoot it to our Q&A portion. We have, we have about a minute left for, uh, for Q&A here before I dive oh. into a couple extra resources. But <clears throat> okay. yeah, Christopher Schneider had, um, thank you, Christopher, um, so asked for, uh, do you have any examples of how you convene multiple stakeholders to address those uh, social challenges of centering data? And Michaela has a really great uh, chat response there. Thank you, Michaela. But Chris, if there has, was anything that else that you wanted to add other than building in like regular meeting infrastructure um, and uh, engaging folks in uh, a collaborative analysis process? Um, I, I, no, I don't. I, I think I would just say to, to reiterate that point of it being very social it is very social mm -hmm. and having an analysis of organizational dynamics i think is very is important so in terms of like the leadership our, our supervisor jose i think is very keen on how organizations work um and how to work within them um so it's i think that's an important aspect of it that it's not just giving people the right ideas but there's a, a like organizations are very complex things and being able to navigate uh, all the technical side of that and emotional side of that and all that kind of stuff is, is an important part of being able to effectively um, build up, uh, yeah, the good sort of data environment. It sounds like you all talk about talking about data at, as as much as you talk about actual data. Does that sound? Yes, that yes, sound good? yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Great, okay. Um, I'm gonna jump to some, just in the interest of time, um, to some additional resources here. Uh, thank you again, again to Chris and McKaylin, um, and uh, I'll be sure, sh sure, excuse me, sure to share this out and I'll share y'all's emails as well. So if anyone has any burning questions that have not yet been answered or you haven't had time to type them out, um, that's okay. Uh, I'll share my email so that you can reach out to me at the end of this workshop. Um, but I want to send everyone out with some further learning resources for you all. These are also all free and publicly available too. Um, don't worry about writing these down. I am going to email this out to everybody. First and foremost, like the DSI is absolutely a resource for you as you're continuing to do this work. So keep an eye on our events and outreach pages and sign up for our newsletter. Sign up for Kids for Chicago's newsletter too while you're at it. Get all the newsletters, uh, stay in touch, stay connected. 
Um, this Data for Social Impact course. Um, so this is a free self-driven online course from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, full disclosure, I just finished it and I had a really great experience. It's a very comprehensive overview of data for social good. Um, and there's a lot of these like building data culture recommendations. Um, one that I really loved was the idea of a data party, which I'm a nerd, so I'm like data party, that sounds fantastic. Um, but the way they describe data party is really setting aside um, a long afternoon, a few hours, um, to, like Chris and McKinnon mentioned, bring it to the table, have those open um, collaborative and communication um, options, and dig into data analysis work together as a multidisciplinary team, which it sounds like you will have done maybe versions of that. Um, the data.org resource library. So this is full of different types of articles, videos, how-tos. You can filter by experience level or by topic. Those are all free to access. Datakind.org also has a really fantastic comprehensive guidebook on data science for nonprofits, specifically for nonprofits and social impact organizations. They have a webinar video series. They have started some discussion networks for nonprofits. Um, and then data.gov as well. Um, we mentioned in our previous workshop that data.gov is a great resource for um, open publicly available data um, from you know, federal, municipal, and county governments. Um, uh, on everything from you know transit to health to education, but it also has some really comprehensive guides and resource documents as well. We do have some multiple opportunities for community partnerships and outreach here at DSI as well. We have data science clinic, that's teams of students with faculty and staff mentors for kind of larger scale projects with community organizations. Um, data for All is an opportunity for high school students to learn about data science skills and careers. Um, applications are closed for the spring, but keep an eye out for the future. Similarly, Summer Lab is our um, opportunity for undergraduates and summer research programs. We also have an industry affiliate program too. So um, if you're here on this call and you um, aren't in a social impact organization, but you work with them or you're really interested in learning more, we do have collaboration opportunities for everyone from startups to Fortune 500 companies, um, connecting industry partners to data science research technologies and talent acquisition. And then we have a few different research projects going on right now too. Uh, one you can participate in right now is uh, through the Internet Equity Initiative. Uh, we have a broadband speed test tool that you can use to help us measure the quality of internet services and expand equitable internet access. Um, and again, if you're interested, check out our website and sign up for our newsletter. Thank you all so much for coming and participating. A huge thank you to our speakers, Chris and McKaylin. Um, thank you all for participating today and sharing um, your experiences with data culture at your at Kids for Chicago. A couple of next steps. I am going to send everyone this slide deck, and that's going to include all the links to all of these resources for you. You are also going to get a short survey, and that is part of our program evaluation. Um, because we want to be able to measure the impact of these workshops and see what folks like yourselves on the front lines of social impact work are interested in, in terms of support, learning, and partnerships. Um, this is my email. You'll also get it from my email in the, our slide deck there. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions at all. And um, thank you again to our wonderful speakers. Thank you for attending.